Daniels here, correctivity for homeostasis and thereby autonomy and sovereignty for European peoples, genus and species, social accountability and correctivity structured by a concept of genetic unionization. I want to do this again because it's important and I want a clean version for posterity. The Charmed Loop of Didactic Incitement. We have now reached a moment at which we can begin to know something of the process of this phony and crooked disease in the pathway we are following. At present, I don't think there are very many of us, a few thousand maybe, but this is a very extraordinary epoch in which this knowledge is now becoming a part of the thinking of quite a lot of people. Thank God. Gregory Bateson, Paradigmatic Conservatism. <clears throat> when he speaks of God, he's speaking of patterns. I developed this hypothesis, what you call the charmed loop of didactic incitement, as an elaboration of Bateson's double bind hypothesis. I believe that it is at least a component or aspect of what he was talking about in that statement. Specifically where he says, we are beginning to know something of the process of this phony and crooked disease in the pathway we are following. He is alluding to a mechanistic process or an abuse and exploitation under the rubric, under the phony rubric of teaching and lesson giving, facilitate quantification of interests accruing to the perpetrators overcoming the borders and boundaries of the victims, while the qualitative niche ecological difference of the victims are ground down. Differences of the victims are ground down, any recourse they might take apparently justifying the abuse. Bateson culminates his epic studies with a question. As teachers, are we wise? And he adds, the road to hell can be paved with bad intentions as well. <clears throat> I propose the charmed loop of didactic incitement as a useful elaboration on Bateson's double bind theory. The double bind proposes the double bind proposed by Bateson in Toward a Theory of Schizophrenia entails a preliminary paradoxic injunction such as I am a liar, the classic liar's paradox, or disobey me, or be spontaneous. Two, a prohibition of metacommunication, prohibiting talk about talk that might help to clarify what was the confusion of the paradox, particularly to clarify goodwill or lack thereof on the relational level of perpetrator and victim. And three, a tertiary reframing, which prevents escape from the circumstance. For example, a child, as dependent on their parents, cannot easily escape the field and is therefore confronted with an intolerable choice between maintaining the confidence in their own perceptions as accurate or, on the other hand, the choice for the necessary relationship of a parent, of the parent. Protecting the capacity for sensible judgment or the relationship, one or the other. As mammals, relationships are profoundly important. <clears throat> and they begin to manifest communicological pathologies in a futile attempt to protect the necessary resource of their faculties, as one cannot not communicate either. There is no apparent way out, as one proves that the cruelty of didactic incitement is justified 
no matter what recourse is taken. Didactic incitement, that is to say, abuse under the rubric of teaching or making one tough, particularly if it is overdone and there is enough contextual force over the victim to keep them from escaping the field, can create a reflexively recursive phenomenon of a pernicious charmed loop. <clears throat> no matter what avenue of escape the victim chooses, they will lose and only add to the warrant of the perpetrator's recursively accruing interests. The charmed loop of didactic incitement. This is going to be a bit redundant because I'm <clears throat> developing from Bateson's double bind hypothesis. <clears throat> there are some infamous command paradoxes in psychology, such as I am a liar, or be spontaneous, or disobey me. I might add, be a man would seem to be yet another form, as the one taking orders is not really in power, not really the man, are they? <clears throat> I would like to submit the hypothesis that one is not in a sufficiently powerful position, that they are susceptible to a charmed loop of didactic incitement. Unlike the classic paradox, however, paradoxia, two phases, this one seems to split four way and may more characteristically unfold over time. There's no apparent way out as one proves the abuse of didactic incitement as justified no matter what recourse taken. <clears throat> and the first option, one is a wimp if they do nothing in response. The abuse is, quote, justified as one proves their own ineffectiveness, their weakness. Two, a pig. If you respond, <clears throat> fighting back directly in self-interest, one justifies the abuse revealing primitive self-interest and a lack of restraint. Three, a dupe. If you try to reason and bargain with the insider issuing forth one's resources. One justifies the abuse in this case <clears throat> and they risk the hideous result of sharing the best they have with the persons treating them the worst in an attempt to reason with them by sharing resource, perhaps the most precious resource. I gave the example of uh, a woman trying to placate a hyper assertive male by giving her sex, though of course, obviously, it can, this can uh, be a situation for males and men as well, that they issue forth the best resource that they might have to the person treating them the worst. So that's the, that's the third bad option, dupe. <clears throat> and in that, you might forms of having the 10 taken in the prisoner's dilemma scenario. Look up the prisoner's dilemma if we want to elaborate that. The fourth option is the permanent puerile initiate. <clears throat> Excuse me. The permanent puerile initiate. The instigators or others looking on or commenting can always treat the abuse as a quote lesson and one may be left with little choice but to treat the didactic incitement as an experience not that bad at worst if not a necessary lesson 
or even an inspiration which would take credit for any achievement despite the abuse thereby justifying the abuse in this case as well hence the charmed loop of didactic incitement <clears throat> i'd like to give the readers uh, the listenership a clue it is probably not an impossible situation for the victim in most cases at least not if granted some time the perpetrators have to have a quanta of power to hold enough contextual force over the victims but <clears throat> it's going to be near impossible to overcome for some especially kids who i guess will escape into some narrative for better or worse but great destruction can be visited upon the victim in the meantime and that's why Bateson asks as teachers in didactic incitement or be wise and he adds the road to hell can be paved with bad intentions as well. That is to say that it might not only be destructive to the victim and their necessary niche ecological position in human ecology, but also uh, put that victim into a reflexive reversal going into aberrant runaway of social productivity to become a victimizer a sociopath so again that is it's no trivial matter it's the culminating question of Bateson's epic, the culminating statement, as he asks, as teachers, are we wise? Adding, the road to hell can be paved with bad intentions as well. Okay, that should be clean enough. And I'll see you Tuesday. Thanks for listening, and bye for now.